First of all, I'd like to acknowledge the, the Creator, the God, for the gift of life, for your health, for your loved ones, and for your families. I acknowledge the Creator for that. I always maintain in my travels here in North America International that Thunder Bay is a great place to be. I believe that Thunder Bay is a great city to be in. But being where we are today is that Thunder Bay does not just happen. It takes an effort of many people. I'm from Musquata myself. The world I see based on my life experience is quite different from most of you. And what you see from your life experience, the perspective of life is different from mine as well. But it's neither right or wrong. If we see the same picture and we have different interpretations, we have a responsibility to work with each other and to educate each other. And that's what we're doing here, coming together, to make Thunder Bay even a better place for all of us and future generations. It's a privilege for me to introduce our keynote speaker today. He's got a bio maybe 10 pages long. And if I were to read that, it would take 40 minutes. And he's got only 40 minutes to speak. That leads me to uh, the main topic of my discussion that I've been asked to talk about. It's called Echoes of a Past Wrong. The wrong was the imposition of the residential school system on Native families from the late 19th to the late 20th centuries. The echoes are the intergenerational effects of the system on the Native people of today, in particular the undermining of families and the despair of young people who all too often are taking their lives. The relevance of speaking about this issue today is that the, in my opinion, the removal of the Native children from their families over such a long period of time, almost a hundred years, was probably the most long-lasting systematic application of discrimination on any component of Canadian society since Confederation. And the subject is not just something which is abstract or academic. Let me explain. In 2002, uh, shortly after I was named uh, Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, I adopted the three causes mentioned, anti-racism, mental health, welfare of Native children, and I left to go into the flying communities of the Nan, Nan Territory. I called on Stan Beardy, and uh, we became good friends, and I relied upon his advice. I tried to, to be of assistance. I flew into um, Kaseshwan, and as my plane was circling the airport, there was a plane taxiing to depart and a great crowd of people. And when I landed, I asked the chief what was going on and he said that a 13-year-old girl had killed herself. And I said, why? And he looked at me as if I didn't really know what was going on, didn't understand. And he said that uh, she had no hope and so she felt she had to die. Then Stan called me not too long afterwards to say that three kids at Wanaman Lake First Nation had killed themselves, including one that hanged herself from a tree a branch as the other kids were coming to school. And he asked me if I would go up with him, talk to the families, talk to the other kids, talk to the chief and council. So I went up. It was uh, very sad. The remaining kids in the combined grade seven and eight class 
were <clears throat> looked to be in a state of terminal depression. They had hoodies over their heads, and they were looking down. They wouldn't look up. And I knew that they were also thinking of, of dying. And I asked the same question, and I was told the same thing. The kids killed themselves because they had no hope. And it was the same elsewhere. I went to, to Mishkogogamank First Nation. And as I drove in from, P from Pickle Lake into the reserve, I was struck by the n number of fresh graves all over the place. When I saw the chief, he said they had had something like 200 violent deaths in the previous 10 years, a lot of them by suicide. The young people hated themselves. They killed themselves. They killed each other. The adults were doing the same thing. I went by a new house that had been trashed, all the windows broken, the furniture thrown out in the street. And he, the chief said, they hate themselves. They hate the community. They hate their parents. They just want to self-destruct. That's why they destroy their houses. Because, he said, they had no hope. And so, I, in that way, discovered that there had been, there was an epidemic of youth suicide going on in the flying communities of the Nan Territory. And that had been going on since 1987, year in, year out. About 25 people every year, most of them children, would kill themselves. And 20 times that number would attempt to commit suicide. And, and fail. And so I asked myself, why were these children, why did these children have no hope? And I, my background at university was history. So I'm very much interested in history and history of Native people. And I took another look at it. And why historically would the kids do this? And discrimination played a major role. Up till the War of 1812, the Native peoples of Canada were needed by the white people. They were needed because they provided the furs that were the main uh, instrument, main generator of, of the economy. They were needed because when the French came, they wanted to save their souls. And the French were very much interested in saving the souls of native people, not just in Canada, but in Paraguay and around the world. They were needed as allies, first of the French, and then of the British in their wars. Then the War of 1812 came along, and it marked a turning point in the relationship. And we're commemorating the War of 1812 now. But in that war, the British were tied up in Europe fighting Napoleon. They only had one regiment of semi-retired troops over here, inadequate to hold off the Americans. So the British relied upon their native allies. And so, but Canada was saved. And that was the last time that native people were really valued in Canada. Because after that, it became the period of settlement. And what people wanted was land. And they didn't, and there were these Indians on the land. And so they moved to a policy of, of unfair treaties. I would call them unfair treaties. They gathered the people together, the people were Ill largely illiterate. They told them one thing and they signed another thing. And through a process which lasted 100 years, they gradually put the native people on little tiny bits of land. Like my First Nation, uh, Rama, they put on uh, 1,100 acres of land that had been found by settlers to be unfit for a cultivation and no one wanted it, and they removed them from uh, the area between Aurelia and Penetang. And it was the same situation. So when people ask you why, or people ask, 
why do Native people stay in these remote reserves, little tiny places where they're so unproductive, you can't make a living, there's no economic activity? You've got to ask yourself, you've got to remember, they didn't ask to be put in those little places. Their land, they were given reserves, and their land was <coughs> taken from them. And they were promised orally that they would be able to hunt and fish on their traditional lands as long as the rivers flow, which is the title of my book. But in fact, they were able to hunt and fish on their traditional lands until the Ontario game wardens arrived and until the uh, settlers or the forestry companies and the mining companies came in and exploited the land. And so great misunderstandings right from the beginning. But I would argue that the loss of land created a tremendous wound in the consciousness of Native peoples, which persists to this day, the fact that their land was taken from them. And no one seems to understand how important the land was to them, both in religious terms, in terms of cultural terms, and it is a great, uh, a great wound which has contributed to the undermining of, of uh, the confidence of Native people. But then the greatest, I would say, not, the, not greater than people being deprived of their land, but the greatest systemic piece of discrimination came about through the residential school system. And one time I used to say to myself that it was good people doing bad things. I'm not sure how good they were. They people, they wanted to have the native people disappear. The, uh, what they talked about was kill the Indian in the Indian. Remove the savage from the Indian through education and take away their children, turn them into brown-skinned white people, and they will blend in in an assimilated manner in Canadian society and will never hear from them again. And it came about in the 19th century um, that they put this into effect. And it went on for year after year uh, decade after decade, and um, uh, completely undermined the family structure in, on First Nation communities. Can you imagine living in a community where there were no children between the ages of 6 and 16 every year where they were taken away? Can you imagine what it must have been like because they tightened up the system? Starting in the 1920s, they sent the police in to take away the kids. <coughs> and then the kids living in barracks, no one ever saying they loved them. And the, and the, uh, the supposed caregivers uh, beating them, abusing them, raping them. And it's, it's hard to understand how that could happen for so many years. In my personal opinion, and I speak only for myself, I don't speak on behalf of the chiefs and all the rest, but my personal opinion is that more emphasis has to be given to the achievements that Native people have, are making to Canadian society today. There are thousands of teachers, and doctors, and lawyers, and pipe fitters, people who have gone through, in large part, the provincial school system, where they have access to better qualified teachers, libraries, and all those sort of things that are on offer. We need to uh, have justice get done for the Native children who live on reserve and who 
Bloomer schools that are falling apart. We have no budgets for books, special education teachers. We need simple human justice that they receive the same level of funding as non-native kids. Stan Beardy, I've heard him say that native people must look to the future and not find themselves handicapped by dwelling all the time on past wrongs. You can't forget them, but you've got to move ahead. You've got to take control of your life. We have to address racism in Canadian society as a whole, not just against native people. And the place to do that is in the schools. Those of you who are my age probably remember when the campaigns for against uh, um, against litter, against tossing cigarette butts and cigarette packages out of cars, and uh, it came into effect back in the 50s. And that started by teaching the kids in school, and the kids taught their parents. We need to do more about that, more about racism in our school curriculums. We need to improve, augment the involvement of civil society in First Nations communities. Frontier College, which sends a hundred of their university students up into the Man Territory, is, an, is a stellar example of what can be accomplished. These young people uh, studying to be do uh, teachers and social workers, they go into the communities, their eyes are open, and they come back and they, are, they have a different appreciation altogether for Native communities and Native people. And they all want to return. We need to have more uh, activities like that where there are more interchange between Native and non-Native people. But overall, we need to have a shift in consciousness in Canada. We need to reflect a bit about what happened in the United States in the early 60s, when the black people said enough is enough, when black writers came out to fuel the intellectual, provide intellectual sustenance to the cause of, of, of black rights, when the uh, huge numbers of white people from the northeastern part of the United States became involved, they worked with black people, worked with Martin Luther King, and they changed the consciousness of the Americans and their attitudes toward the rights of black people. We need to do the same thing here in Canada for Native people to deal with the issue of discrimination. And so, that is my message to you today. It's been a pleasure.